simple, simple utopia code, which is which also happens to be the library that our project is built on. So we can you know we can we can create nodes, we can store them, and then we can combine them into a tree-like structure. And um, and so the main advantage of code is it lets you abstract things, and that lets you represent things much more concisely. Like we can have a huge tree, um, and then we can. If you want to repeat that same thing, uh, transpose an octave up, then that's really easy. You can just do something with functors and like map a transformation. Right? Whereas if you had a score, you'd have to repeat the same number of notes and just transpose an octave up, and it would take a lot more space. So code has these powerful features for letting you be more concise with music. Um, but it's still, it's still not great. Well, so how good code is at representing music depends on the library you, we use. And um, there are some types of music that aren't covered well, in my opinion. So code is great at representing regular musical structures, and here I mean, well, we've seen some great examples today, right? We can we can apply a variety of transformations to very large musical structures, like um, like transposing things or adding some or turning each note into a small melody and then like binding it back into into a tree. And um, stuff like that, so like regular structures in that way. Um, and code is also great at um, representing things non-deterministically. Like if you use constraint satisfaction, you can specify kind of a space of pieces that have a similar feeling depending on your constraints. And um, and you can also use machine learning. You can also um, you can use grammars. There's there's a lot of um, non-determinism. Non-determinism lets you uh, generate detail very well. But uh, there's this one thing that I think is missing, which is representing a specific piece deterministically that has lots of pretty details. Like, you know, um, well, we'll show some examples here, right? So, so here we have two fragments of music that are the same except for one note. And this is actually not so bad, right? If you represent the first one as a tree, then you can define like a way to travel down the tree and select an element and then change that. And then you can make the second one depend on the first one that way. But this doesn't scale well if you have lots of gritty details. Like, you know, if, if the second, if the bottom two notes of the second chord, if you want to move those down, then that'll be another thing. And then if you want to move another note or delete a note or change a rhythm, then that's that's like, it quickly becomes hairy to the point that you'd rather just look at a score than look at a code that might be more concise, um, but has a lot of uh, small details. So, and and here's another example that's a bit different. And a bit messier, right? So, so you have you have the same rhythm across all of these fragments, um, and there's there's a lot of other similarities. Like the middle two notes are repeated for each of them, but then like the harmony is a bit different um, across them, and the pitches are slightly different, even though the number of notes in the first chord is the same. And then there's just a lot of overlapping patterns and small differences and things like that. Um, and and keep in mind these might be scattered at very different locations and pieces. So, um, so to, to represent something like this concisely, you have to you have to take all those factors into account. And so this brings us to um, a solution that we found that uh, uh, that I present now. So, so first off, we'll we'll define like a musical event, uh, a MIDI note, as a product of all these <laughs> things. And it's not really important what they are exactly. Um, I mean. There's, there's a duration, there's a volume, and there's a pitch. And behind the pitch, we add a bunch of other tonal stuff because we're representing a tonal piece, and those things make it easier to uh, express certain things. Um, so, but just the important thing is that a note is just a uh, product of a bunch of different things, and then you can define functions that manipulate uh, subsets of these things. And um, and yeah, so so the the composition of a note is kind of horizontal, and now vertical structure is how you arrange those notes into a piece of music. So, um, yeah, so we have, we have a, we, we organize the piece into a tree, um, and we divide it into levels. So uh, you can locate a note by specifying which branch to take at each of those levels. So the first branch in this example is between the left hand and the right hand. Uh, the right hand is zero, and the left hand is one, we, since we use indices. Second branch is between the four chords in well, in the right hand it would be four chords, in the left hand it would be three chords, but we're showing the right hand, so there are four chords, and th within each of those chords there's a number of voices. Here there's two. So this lets you create a sort of address for each, um, for each note in a piece. And 
And uh, if you want to choose one node, um, we define this. Um, we define this set of composable functions that lets you specify the uh, paths to take in each dimension. So, um, so here we're specifying the first, the zeroth hand, the, the zeroth code, and the zeroth voice. And uh, through some pseudocode magic, that gives you something that selects that part of the tree. Uh, in this case, it's just one node. But you can also select multiple nodes if you, since we have a list, list of indices, you can specify multiple nodes if you pass in uh, multiple indices. So here we're selecting the entire first core by taking both of the voices. And you can, you can you know, arbitrarily expand the indices to select larger pieces, larger parts of the piece. Um, and so now that we have a way to select things, we also want a way to uh, modify them. So, so these are these are again, it's pretty pseudocody, but I hope the intent is clear. So there's um, we have a location, and then at that location, we we use functions that set the duration, the pitch, the volume, and so on. So here we're setting the first chord to uh, dotted quarter note duration, and the last three chords to the eighth note duration, and. Uh, that it's kind of represented in the tree as well, and also on the score. So, um, and, and the aim is by, by creating a bunch of these and putting them into a, into a more efficient format, we can represent a piece rather concisely. And um, so you may have noticed that these two locations share some similar, uh, similar um, aspects in, at certain levels of the tree. Like they're both referring to the zero at hand, and they're both referring to the zeroth and first voices. Um, so a prefix tree just is a way of uh, taking these, uh, extracting these similarities and putting them in one node, one node, and then uh, branching off of that node um, by adding the things that are different in, in each one. And uh, so this is the way we can represent multiple, um, multiple transformations on music in one data structure and, and uh, also keep that data structure relatively compact compared to specifying all these separately. And that's, that's, the, that's the depiction of this in the tree. The magenta branches are the, uh, are the shared ones between both of these um, transformations. And so we can, we can look at a few examples where we're recreating actual music of this. So this is a short motive. Um, and we've, I've taken out some of the boilerplate involved in creating the tree. So the, the, the root node is, uh, specifies that we're referring to the right hand. And we're setting the pitch to uh, C5, which is again pseudocode. And we're setting the scale to uh, the A, well, the A major scale. I mean, A minor scale. Well, yeah, yeah, A minor scale. And, um, Right, and then and then below we have four different branches that each modify a different part of the piece and apply transformations on top of that. So one of them sets the duration of the first chord. The uh, the another sets the uh, the yellow one sets the duration of the next three chords, and then the green one moves the um, moves the middle two notes down by one chord degree, and the blue one moves all of these uh, all of the bottom notes down by two chord degrees. Uh, so, so that's that's how we, we kind of abstracted uh, a set of shared characteristics into the root node, and then each of the branches adds its own layering on top of that. So we can also we can also uh, show the left hand as well. So here we have um, we have a slightly different structure because there are only three chords, um, and the one thing that's common to all three of these is that they're all quarter note durations. So we put that in the root. And then the uh, the first chord has a special pitch, and the second the second and third chords also have uh, have different pitch content. So we we do the, we specify those uh, in their own branches. Um, and there is a bit of layering here going on. So first we set both of the both the voices in the second chord and the third chord. Well, the the, the one chord and the right the zero index seems a bit confusing. Sorry about that. Um, and um, yeah, so, so first we transform both of the last two chords, and then we transform the last chord, uh, building on top of that earlier transformation, because they are somewhat related. Um, or at least this way of representing them uh, implies that they're somewhat related. 
Right, and here's a bigger example. Um, a lot of the low-level details omitted, but we can see at the high level that, you know, first, first we, we, we split the zeroth, first, and third measures from the second one. Because if you, if you look at them, then there's a lot of shared material between measures 0, 1, and 3. Like, if you look at the first two measures in the right hand, they're actually exactly the same. And the, uh, the right hand upon the, in, the, in the last measure is also very similar. Um, because it, it has the same rhythm, even though it might not have the same pitches. And um, whereas the measure two has an entirely different rhythm in the right hand, and also has different uh, harmonic content. Um, so so we, we, we're kind of free to split the piece however we want to ensure that we're partitioning the, um, the similar areas together. And uh, yeah, so you can also see in the lower level that uh, if you look at the left hand, there is um, there's one note that's different in the first measure in the left hand, and and uh, and we move that down by branching uh, further down um, and moving that note down on the on the last two measures uh, right there. So yeah, it's I guess this 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 shows the um, the flexibility you have in choosing. Which parts of the tree to branch, and and um, in a way in a way that you can uh, maximize your amount of shared material. Um, and he, here's a uh, bigger example. Um, I think the colors do most of the talking. Uh, again, <laughs> again we branch on we split between the zero measure zero one and three, and then we separate the second the second measure because it's. Uh, Again, it's a, the rhythmic content is very different, and um, and within those measures, we further branch, uh, and and split depending on uh, depending on the differences between them. So you can see in that that big blue area on the left that um, those those measures are all actually exactly the same, even though they occur in very different areas of the piece. So we only have to specify them once. And in the tree, we, uh, we, sh we specify which measures and which periods and which. So we, we specify which parts of the piece they apply to uh, in the tree. And um, yeah. And here's a bit of a smaller example. Um, the, this time, there's a, the pseudocode is changed to actual code <laughs> because it's small enough that it fits. And um, well, there's still a bit omitted, but. Uh, so here we have a case where the harmony is mostly independent of the uh, actual other content in, in the piece. Um, we have, so each measure has its own chord, but each measure, um, but within each measure, the left hand and the right hand are very different. They have different rhythms, and there's different, slightly different voicings for all of the chords, and that's all kind of abstracted away down here, and we're free to set the, uh, the harmony um, up there, just specify a, a different chord for each for each measure, and um, so th this this shows how you can kind of uh, horizontally um, split the piece into the harmony and duration and uh, and pitch and separate those as well if uh, if that leads to more concise code. Um, yeah, and so so. I think this is an interesting way to look at music. At least the pictures are interesting to me. The code is not so readable. Um, the thing about code is that uh, the, score, the score representation is just very compact and optimized for easy understanding. Like if you compare a score to uh, a listing of MIDI notes for, for every note in the score, then you know, the score is just way better. And code, is, code kind of suffers from a similar issue. Right. Um, even even with this compact, more compact representation than specifying each note separately, even though it's better than that, it's still uh, it's still just harder to read than the score. And there's like no reason you would do you would compose using code this way, um, using this this kind of code at least. There's no reason you would use that instead of using Finale or MuseScore or one of those editors um, in this current state. But I think that if we were able to 
hide, hide the code to the visualizations, right? Like if you hide a branch and then it shows a corresponding area in the score, and also if you, you can switch to like, you can switch to the tree that you can, you can eliminate everything but duration, like rhythm from the tree, and then you can see how those duration patterns in the tree are reflected in the score. Um, <laughs> Like some, something similar to the images I've used, but more interactive and more, um, more consistent. Um, I think that would be an interesting tool for both analyzing music and composing it. It's just a lot of work, probably a lot more work than went into this. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's one area of future work. And apart from that, of course, this is all done on one specific piece. And that piece is somewhat reflective of tonal pieces in general, I suppose, but there's definitely a lot of nuances that, uh, that uh, there's a lot of different transformations that'll be valid for different pieces, and uh, especially for non-Western music and so on. So those are the two main avenues of future work that I see. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, I, uh, I, I feel like I might want to compose using this as long as there's, as you said, there's some kind of correspondence between the code and the score. And it, it makes me think about CSS. Um, the, the way you select what to change yeah. and then change it along different dimensions, and, and mm -hmm. you know nowadays even browsers there are these interfaces that tie CSS uh, code to the resulting score, you might say. And, and so far, uh, maybe uh, is that a kind of source of inspiration? Possibly yeah, for I think when I was creating the images for this, I kind of ah. felt similar vibes. Like you know, if I want to transform every single circle on the image right. except for one, then that's kind of similar to this, right? You want to move every note up except one or something right. like that. Yeah. And I guess there's a lot of conceptual overlap between this and image editing and especially web layouts. Um, but I haven't really explored that, though that, would, that is a very good place to explore, I think. Are you using lenses for the combinators? Um, so, <laughs> so originally I used lenses and then my advisors thought maybe that Maybe it was worth just using a simpler representation so we didn't have to explain lenses in the paper, and so I didn't use lenses. But mm -hmm. they, they do work as lenses, yes. Okay, but this would allow you to have more complex traversals. So now you're just zooming in, <coughs> mapping something over all the elements, zooming more, mapping some. Okay. Maybe you want to, well, go up and down, or... That, that is a possibility. Um, I'm not sure how well it will play with with the existing structure, I guess it's, it's worth investigating. Yeah, and I didn't investigate that. Um, but it might cause certain things to be more difficult. And it's possible I tried it and then that happened and I forgot about it. But yeah, that's, that's research. How do you deal with tying out between two chords? Which chord owns that or do they both own it? Um, I think I just treat it as a single note that has an extended duration. And yeah, that's kind of a, that's a case where this isn't so elegant. In fact, there are a lot of, since I, I cherry picked the good parts to show you, right? There are a lot of cases where this doesn't really work and I have to revert to just specify each note manually and when changes uh, do that. And I think that's partially due to the um, lack of musical abstractions. I mean, there could always be better work done there. Uh, don't um, feel bad about it. Ty used to give many people problems. That's why I was curious <laughs> about it, if you had yeah. a way to do that. There are a lot of musical things that, uh, that are problematic. There are just so many cases. Yeah. So I was wondering, I mean, the, the, this shows very nicely the, the structure of the music of this particular piece that you have. You repeat one part and then change it and it be something similar. Um, if given a musical piece, can you parse it in such a tree? So for instance, if you take Donya's results and you parse it into this and do you get a tree out of that, is that somehow possible? Oh, I, as I understood you, you specified a tree in advance and generate music yes. from there, but it is also possible the other way around? Um, it's all manual right now. I, I suppose I don't really understand algorithms for this well enough to say. Um, it seems very intimidating to me, but I'm, I'm sure there's actually a lot of, there is work done on this, uh, or adjacent things like analyzing musical patterns uh, automatically, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it seems promising, but I'm not aware of the research. First piece of music that came to mind when I saw this was I'm sure about piano studies. They're extremely regular, so you may find that quite interesting to analyze how, how much you can compress them. Oh, Chopin like the, the etudes? 
Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I also like I first started doing this on the Philip Glass piece, so that was also <laughs> also quite quite a bit easier. But yeah, uh, those those would definitely be suitable. Uh, uh, like you, you showed your representation referred a lot to the hands, right? Yeah. Like the right hand, but sometimes like and and often those correspond to voices, right? I mean, I, I don't understand that much about music, but then oftentimes you could have the situations where the hand kind of crosses to the other, like the voice crosses to the other hand, or there's a, a you know, like cross hands, or, mm -hmm. or that you, you can't play too far with hands crossed, and so the, you end up using the right hand to, to continue a certain voice which was actually being expressed. So if you consider it instead of using the hands expressing uh, 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 voices, you know? Um, yeah, I think, so, so the, the structure of the tree was hard-coded for this particular piece. Um, if there were a different piece, like if it were a four, four-part harmony, then you definitely use different different tree levels and name them differently. Um, and yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. Just just use a different structure according to the piece. Uh, any other question? Yeah. So you said the structure of the tree is hard coded for this piece. Does that mean when I see the the each each time you have with a pseudo code or real code, um, these are modifications to a tree that um, is fixed, or should I think that? The, the parts of the tree are kind of dynamically generated, like if you refer to a voice and the voice springs into existence. Yeah, that's exactly how it's done, actually. Okay. So it looks so at the entire tree. There's nothing hard coded then, no? Well, the number of levels and their names is hard coded, but the uh, the structure of the tree is dynamically generated based on that tree. Okay. Right. That tree gets compared to a concrete tree. Yes. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.